The subject is, of course, very topical, is clearly evidenced by the Global Offshore Wind Conference and Exhibition that's currently taking place uh, today and tomorrow in London. But before I um, introduce our accomplished presenters, I'd just like to share a few kind of key introductory messages on behalf of our branch committee. So for the time being, all of our events continue to be held online, but we look forward to seeing you all again face to face sometime in the not too distant future when it's fully safe to do so. Um, you will know that our upcoming events and activities have all been announced, so please keep an eye on the calendar um, for, on the Br Branch West page for any updates. Sadly, I have to say that we've taken the decision to further postpone our branch's annual dinner, which is now scheduled to take place on Thursday the 12th of May 2022. Like the equally delayed latest joint James Bond movie, this is a highly anticipated event and we only have a few tables left. So please get in touch with us if you want to get involved. Best not to be shaken or stirred by missing out on this one. Some of the proceeds from this dinner will be going to the Pound for Piper Trust, of which I'm also one of the trustees. So please continue to support our branch's fundraising efforts by signing up for those last few tables of spaces. Finally, uh, I'd just like to extend our thanks and appreciation to our branch partners, Billfinger UK Limited and Imrand, for supporting our events and activities programme this year. Their continued support means a great deal to us. So let's get on to our presentation today. I would ask that everyone, bar our presenters, please switch off your cameras and mute your mics for the duration. But do, however, remember to post your questions or comments in the chat box. We will pick these up after the presentations and share with the panel, time permitting. So now to welcome our guest presenters at today's session. Uh, I'm delighted that we've been joined today by both Carl Daly and Frederick von der Fer of Dot Subsea. So Dof Subsea are part of a strategic contract and partnership formed to deliver the High Wind Tampon project. The team at Dof Subsea has specific responsibility for all of the quayside and offshore marine activities associated with the towage and installation of the 11 floating foundation units for the project, during which they will be utilizing some of the world's most powerful seagoing tugs and DP2 construction vessels. Carl is a fairly recent recruit for DOF Subsea, but comes with 20 plus years of experience across the energy sector. And whilst based here in Aberdeen as Vice President for Offshore Wind, Carl has a global remit. Frederick, on the other hand, based out of Bergen, but brings a wealth of experience across the engineering, project management and the QHSE spaces. And he's currently a project manager delivering the marine installation work scopes for the High Wind Tampon project. So without further ado, Carl, I'm going to pass over to you to kickstart today's presentation. Carl. Thanks, Dan. I will just start to share my screen. <clears throat> and put it in presentation mode. Okay, so hopefully you can all see my screen. So again, uh, I'd just like to reiterate the thanks to you all for, for joining us uh, this evening as it is in the UK. Um, I'd also like to thank the Energy Institute for giving this opportunity to, uh, to share a little bit about DOF and uh, quite a bit about uh, the exciting Highland Tampin project that we're, we're involved in. So as Dan said, I'm a fairly new recruit to DOF, uh, just over four months with the company now. Um, however, I was first introduced to DOF when I started in the industry about 20 years ago, my first vessel I ever sailed on was a so I've always had quite fond memories of, uh, of my time with DOF. Uh, we're going to speak a little bit about DOF, as I said, and uh, Frederick is going to give you uh, the ins and outs of how you install one of these uh, very complex infrastructure projects. So a little bit about DOF to start with. So uh, DOF is uh, started in Osterval in Norway in 1981 by the, the Monster family. DOF is an international group of company which owns a specialist fleet of uh, subsea and towage vessels. And in 2005, uh, they created DOF Subsea to combine a strong engineering capabilities with modern fleet of uh, subsea vessels to service offshore energy markets. So in DOF Subsea, we provide integrated solution to marine projects. So We've got the vessels, 
the equipment and the people to deliver these projects. We innovate and we care for the environment while we're executing them. This is a slide we're all quite proud of in DOF. Um, in 2021, in May, in fact, we were uh, nominated by the Financial Times as one of Europe's uh, climate leading companies. So there's 200 companies chosen by Financial Times. Um, we were one and one of only 12 companies that's involved in transport type industry. And this is for a, a decade long strategy of uh, minimizing our emissions and our environmental impact. Uh, something else we're very proud of is being nominated by Amnesty International for being uh, one of the top five global Nordic companies with best scores relating to human rights and as a responsible employer. Some numbers on, on DOF. So we have a total fleet of around 64 specialized vessels. We operate in four uh, territories around the world. We've got eight regional offices, if you can see the, the little yellow dots on that uh, map. And we operate around 74 subsea uh, or V systems or remote submarines and autonomous underwater vehicles. We employ around 3,400 people currently, but we're, we're expanding quite rapidly. So it's increasing the whole time. We have a backlog currently of around $1.5 billion. I mentioned there DOF and DOF subsea. So DOF managed the vessels within the, within the group, uh, the crewing side of it and the vessel operation itself. And, and DOF subsea, we manage and execute the projects as uh, Frederick will be explaining to you a little bit later on. So one, co one company, but there's a DOF and a DOF subsea. Some of the vessels that we operate in the subsea arena, um, got the Scandi Scans and the vessel on the bottom left picture there, um, one of our, our larger vessels. Um, just draw attention to some parts of that. So it's, it's a class A anchor handler, uh, which means it's one of the most powerful tug vessels in the world. It's got a bollard pull, a capacity to pull of over 350 tons. To put that into con context, uh, the two large tugs that freed the ever given vessel from, which was blocking the Suez Canal early in, in the year, had a combined uh, bollard pull of around 300. So this vessel on its own is, is way above that capacity. It's also got two uh, remote submarines permanently installed and a crane that can lift uh, 300 tons uh, down to around two miles below the sea surface. Around over 3,000 meters of wire on the crane. Quite an impressive vessel. We've also got some uh, large construction vessels like Scandi Africa and Scandi Acergy. And these vessels are around 160 meters in length. So again, context around that, a football pitch is 100 meters or so in length. So, so getting on for two football pitches in length. The Africa is a 900 ton uh, subsea crane, again, with capacity to reach seabed at, at nearly two miles below the surface. And they got a, a lay tower, that yellow tower, you can take a picture of laying flexibles, umbilicals, power lines, and it can, can hold about 650 tonne of tension on, on that. So, so again, uh, quite a large capable vessel. And the Scandi Acergy, the bottom right picture, currently working on a wind farm off the uh, east coast of Scotland, the NNG wind farm. Again, it's used uh, because of its large capacity. It's a 400 ton crane and a large back deck. So it can handle a lot of uh, equipment on there. And again, both uh, have permanent uh, double large uh, ROVs on board these uh, remote submarines. All these vessels are dynamically positioned, as we say, in the business. And uh, for those who, do, who, who don't know much about it, which there may be one or two, this is a, a system where the vessels can stay in one position, either close to a platform or some infrastructure or just over a point on a map. Um, they do that with a combination of GPS positioning and uh, wind sensors, current sensors, and motion sensors. They've got very advanced uh, power generation systems and propulsion systems. They're all computer controlled. So uh, the vessels can stay on position and, and even up to storm force winds and 
they do that with uh, advanced propulsion. As I said, they've got a bank of thrusters under the keel. On the stern of the vessel, they'll have uh, the main propeller propulsion systems that uh, can actually rotate through 360 degrees so they can push or pull the vessel in any given direction. Up front, there's typically twin tunnel thrusters which can hold the vessel's heading and, and pull it to uh, port or starboard. And again, usually uh, another as you thruster that can drop down through the keel to again push or pull the vessel in any given direction. So all these uh, thrusters are used to hold station, as we call it. And uh, as I said, again, up to storm force conditions, these vessels can stay on position to around about one meter. So some of uh, DOF subsidies capabilities and, and what we do with these vessels, we predominantly work in the oil and gas industry, renewable industry, as I mentioned, but also aquaculture and, and some uh, research projects as well. So we'll build marine infrastructure at sea. We'll decommission it, so we'll, we'll rip it out again. Um, we're involved in moorings. We'll design your mooring system. We'll install your mooring system. And Frederick will be talking a bit about that later. That's what we'll be doing on high wind. Uh, we carry out surf projects, some subsea umbilical risers and flow line installation. Uh, we work within IRM or renewables O&M market where we inspect, repair and maintain subsea infrastructure. And we carry out survey work. So we'll map the seabeds, uh, we'll um, inspect subsea structures and we'll provide and collect geotechnical data for, for use for uh, site investigations or for installation of subsea structures. I have a couple of slides just on two interesting projects or well, interesting to me anyway, but uh, recently we were involved in a project of uh, Angola. Uh, we inspected over 2000 kilometers of, of pipeline in subsea infrastructure using an autonomous uh, underwater vehicle. Um, you can see some images of the, uh, the, the the subsea structures that we, we took during this campaign and uh, fitted to the AUV were high definition digital camera, uh, some uh, bathymetric sensors to, to map the sea floor and a cathodic protection system. There's non-contact cathodic protection system, um, which is uh, you know, a prerequisite for using on AUV and quite proud of it. We didn't lose the, or the AUV after two and a half thousand kilometers or so. so quite proud of that achievement. Um, another one quite recently was uh, we were called to look at um, a pipeline that was buried. It had uh, an anchor dragged over it and they were concerned that it had some damage or could, could fail. So the pipeline was shut in. They called us out to uh, dredge the area around the pipeline and fit a, a CT scanner. So, so that's a scanner as you know, you're probably familiar with it, in hospitals to image the, the pipeline on the inside of it. So, we dredged around the pipe, exposed it, fitted the scanner uh, and scanned the pipeline to build up a 3D model of it. The, uh, the model was then assessed and uh, it was luckily on this occasion, uh, okay to continue operation. So we backfilled the project, but this was all quite an emergency uh, last minute job. And went really smooth. So get involved in all sorts. On to floating wind. And I guess the main reason that we're here. So, uh, yeah, we've talked a bit about the areas we work in and our capabilities and, and, and floating wind is a new area for the industry, as Dan mentioned. Um, we are lucky enough to be involved in it early on. And, and as we said, it's going to be uh, prime time on the largest floating wind farm when it's uh, developed and built next year. Current largest wind farm is just off the coast of Aberdeen, uh, Kincardine Wind Farm, and it was uh, commissioned just very recently, or maybe it's still undergoing commissioning. So. It'll be the largest, but only for a few months before uh, high wind takes over. So there's two um, avenues, I guess, to, to um, floating wind. There's the uh, power generation for the national grid to power our homes and, and cities. Um, question, why, why floating wind? So we've, we've got uh, onshore wind, we've got offshore fixed foundation wind. And the new technology floating wind. So, so why, why and, and what is it all about? Well, the thing with floating wind is that it, it can produce higher yield. So for each kilometer of seafloor that's leased out, 
like Crown Estate in the, in the UK or, or, or whatever national government around the world, you, you can gather higher uh, electricity or generate higher electricity due to the more consistent and generally speaking higher wind speeds uh, further from, from shore. So uh, high wind Scotland, which is a 30 megawatt development built by Equinor a few years back has been for the last three years, the most efficient and highest yielding wind farm in the whole of the UK. These floating wind farms can be put further from shore. So not everyone likes to see these turbines out their window as, or as they walk the dog along the beach. So it can be pushed further out to sea. Again, higher yield, but also less, less visually intrusive and also further away from nesting bird colonies, for instance. So to get them offshore, it's, uh, it's out, of, um, out of view of the harm. They're, they're quite mobile, obviously. We can, we can move them around, but what that means is that they can be fitted pretty much anywhere. Um, so if, if it's close to a, a city, for instance, or a large industry area and the seabed is quite rocky, for instance, or quite deep, uh, it doesn't restrict floating wind insulation. So, so they can be moved around and installed uh, pretty much anywhere shallow water as well as deep, but certainly in countries where they've got uh, steep um, continental shelf, uh, steep shorelines, deep water, these are ideal. So if you think of the west coast of Scotland, west coast of Ireland, uh, of California, Hawaii, uh, and, and places like France and uh, Japan, these are all ideal areas for, for this type of technology so that they can harness uh, renewable offshore power and not be restricted by, uh, by water depth. Um, yeah, the suitability for deep water means that they've, uh, they can be, uh, you know, fitted anywhere we really want them to. And, and some of the problems on the fixed um, foundation installations is that sites with varying water depth cause issues. But again, with floating, uh, they overcome them. So there's quite a lot of advantages to it. So why not? Um, it's more expensive. Restricts fishing activities. You can't trawl through these sites because there's uh, mooring systems or station keeping systems under the surface, so you can't drag your trawl nets through. Um, and we've got a, currently an underdeveloped supply chain, so we're trying to address that right now. But that all leads to problems. So we've uh, wired off getting into the business. I guess should be the next question, but this this graph might explain it. So. Um, we're, we're in 2021, we're, we're installing Hiram Tampa in 2022, and it is on that graph, but it, it's so small you can barely see it. So you can see that the growth potential is right there towards the end of the decade at 2035. So we're expecting massive increases in growth. Um, we need around 10 Highwind Tampons to even start being able to be seen on this graph. 10 Highwind Tampons wouldn't even get us a one on the scale, uh, but, but close to a one. So there's a, a lot of opportunities and a lot of building required to, to get up to the levels that are needed and up to the, these project, project, projections to 2030 and beyond. For that to happen, we need the cost to come down. So again, another graph. Um, this is showing the fixed foundation is the, the bottom blue or, or gray line there and the red line is floating. So high wind tamp and they estimate around 140 euro per megawatt. Um, it needs to come down to be on par with, with uh, the majority of fixed installation. So need to be down into the, the 60, 50 euros per megawatt hour to be better. But they estimate that by the end of the decade, we'll be, we'll be on, on a level pegging. And, and, and you can see why the two graphs kind of correlate. Another area of interest is electric, electricity generation uh, for oil and gas infrastructure. So the uh, Oil and Gas Authority in the UK have reported that uh, platform electrification is essential for cutting oil and gas sector production emissions in the near term and critical for preserving the industry's social license to operate. Um, they also say that platform electrification with, with floating wind will help develop uh, floating wind power technologies in the UK and contribute towards a 75 gigawatt capacity ambition by, by 2050. So they feel that oil and gas platform electrification can help and push the technology forward. So Crown Estate Scotland have launched a new leasing round. It was just introduced this month. It will be uh, going out in 2022 uh, to target emission reduction by 50% by 2030. Um, this is a, a, a chart or map from um, Marine Scotland. Um, the purple dots are uh, 
current surface infrastructure for, for oil and gas facilities, predominantly Scotland and the northern half of the UK. And the area hatched in blue is, is areas they feel um, they're, or they wish to, to lease out for uh, floating uh, wind uh, generation. Um, and these areas are for the commercial developments of over 100 megawatts. So it depends who you listen to, but the, there are several, several gigawatts of potential for floating wind uh, for platform electrification in the UK, particularly Scotland. Uh, one company has already started that and have applied for leases, Cerulean Winds, they're called, and uh, they're looking for a license to, to generate three gigawatts of power um, for platform electrification. Again, this, this is just a UK example, but it's not just a UK problem. So we're here in the same in, in Brazil and various other parts of the world that are looking at electrification. Just to put into context, the um, again, the, the one gigawatt uh, or a gigawatt, again, it's, it's a large nuclear power station or two, two large uh, coal power stations per, per gigawatt. So these are, these are vast. Uh, so that's about it from me. I, I hope you got a little bit on, on top of sea and why we're, we're getting into floating wind. Thank you for your time. I'll hand over to, to Frederick just now for the, for the interesting part of the... Uh, okay, thank you, Phil. I'll just share my screen as well. Okay, so Hive and Tampen. I'll uh, tell you a little bit about Hive and Tampen, what we have done so far and the status right now, and then I'll uh, go into what's going to happen next here on the on the installation. And through the whole presentation, the focus will really be on on the marine operations and uh, not so much the building. But uh, I will first kick off with a little film that gives you a general introduction to Hyman Tampen. I think that the, the sound might not work, but there is text and it's just two minutes and then uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. So that was the short introduction to Hive and Tampen. So as Carl mentioned, there are some projects that uh, electrify the grid and there are some that uh, 
help clean uh, the actual production of oil. And this project is then of that last type. It is uh, about producing power to the oil fields, Nora and, uh, and Gulfox. And just to sort of give a bit of scale of things, this is an 88 megawatt park, which is then almost 0.1 gigawatt. So when you compare it to the to the projections for 10 to 15 years ahead, it's just uh, 0.1 from the one gigawatt size to half a gigawatt size that the, the parks that are on the drawing table now uh, have. So it's it's a relatively small project, even though it is it's not so small as you will see now now soon. So our role in Hive in Tampan, what I just showed you in the film, was the Equinor, uh, our client's view on it. And what we have is that it's an EPCI contract. So it's engineering, procurement, construction, installation, building the, the substructures, which the wind turbines will be on, and delivering the mooring system for the floaters. We do not deliver the, the power cables. Arco Solutions has the main contract and DOF for has the marine installation manager in that contract. So that's me as the marine installation manager for the OXO contract during the building. And then as we work, we also share the engineering services for the marine operations uh, with the ARCO solutions for the building. So as you see on the pictures here, the first part, the first 20 meters of the substructure is built onshore and then as they start floating, we move them down to another side and slip form them down to their full height, which is around 108 meter height. And then they are told again of the ghoul where we assemble the wind turbines. And then under this main EPCI contract, there is a joint venture between Arco Solutions and of Subsea, in which we have the actual installation contract. So I am the project manager for that contract. So then I will do uh, with my team, the installation of the turbines onto the substructures and also the installation of the floating wind turbines in the sea. And uh, this work was tendered 2018, 2019. There was not just a tender, but it was an RFI phase with the development of the concept, etc., before the actual tendering. And then the contract was awarded late 2019 and will go until uh, next summer. Uh, just a little refresher from what you saw on the film. So the first part of the building of the substructure took place at Arco Solutions yard at Stor. And then we have established the site for the slip forming in Domasnes, which is about a 12 hours tow south of this uh, area. And then there is, will be in March this year, we will have completed the substructure to their full height, all of them. And then we will tow them up on a 2.5 days up the west coast of Norway, up to Gul, where we will complete the assembly and put the Siemens wind turbines on top. And then we will tow them out to the field outside. So the activities are moving a bit up and down here on the west coast of Norway. So going into what's happened so far, uh, we have this work at Stort, which was completed this spring. And then we told the structures down to, to Domas Ness. And before we could do that, we must, of course, establish the site, which is three North Sea barges. So it's roughly 300 meters from here to here. And there we slip from the 11 floaters into the, into the sea. So this has been for, there's been two high wind projects before this one. It was high wind demo around 2007 and then high wind Scotland and now high wind pump. And for all the projects, they've had surprises, I would say, regarding how, how large the structures are inshore. And we had pretty much the same here as well. So one of the first surprises is really the loads and the actual capacity of this system needs to be quite large as every structure here is 20,000 tons. So it's quite a lot of weight and size on the outer barges here and quite significant loads. So in addition to that, it's not so easy to set the anchors in a fjord because it's relatively steep slopes here underwater before the, the seabed goes flat under here. This is, this, it has to be because the structures go 100 meters into the water. So there's nowhere to put anchors in the slope because all the sediments fall down to the seabed. So at the seabed, it is possible to put the anchors and we were able to get it uh, done. But as you see, we ended up with an 
anchor handler, typical offshore face also to set up the site inshore with these pictures are from Norman Drott, which was the vessel we used. And uh, it's really just like a typical FPSO hookup almost, the, the pictures you see now. So these are the anchors, which are then tested to 190 ton holding capacity in the fjord before we can move this uh, structure. And then this is a detailed drawing of the moorings. So we have got the moorings on the outer and the inner system. And originally we had some challenges here because the loads on these inner moorings, they become too high. The key is here and there are bollards, which are very large bollards because this site has had large projects before, but we, we were not able to take up the loads. So we actually needed to put a hinge in here it's just one fender here, you can see, and there are two up here. So these two are quite stiff, and this will move around this point here to reduce the loads down here. So it's uh, it's not often thought about, but these inshore operations that are also considered small, they are they are really not small already on this relatively small project. And uh, again, we had the challenges here with the soil condition, and in addition, after we won the project almost on the day we won the project uh, on uh, power company or internet supplying company into, uh, installed a subsea fiber optic cable here going between some main cities on the west coast of Norway just a few meters off where we're going to put the anchors but uh, we were lucky so they were only 50 meters away from where we were going to put the anchor so we, we, we managed that without any conflict there but there are uh, Typical surprises like this when you work inshore. Uh, and then after we had prepared the site, we of course had to complete the works at stored. And here you can see two of the structures. They were slip formed up to 20 meters with the first half product of the substructure. And then we did that for all the 11 structures in the dock. And here you can see they are all completed, 11 of them. And at this stage, we have opened the dock to take out the, the floating substructures. And this operation is a little bit interesting because the crane here is a thousand ton capacity crane and the structures are 5,000 ton. And the amount of water in the dock when you flood it is not sufficient to, to make them float. So the crane needs to lift it at the same time as they are lifted by the, the uplift in the, in the water. So there's a bit of a combined operation there. So then the crane lift them up and we pull them out here with the boat as the crane moves. And then when we come out, we cannot just release the crane because the substructures are then not stable. So if we just release the crane, the substructure will actually tip over. So then we had to fill it with water before we could release the crane. And then sort of the third challenge in this operation is that the hooks here have no connection points because we cannot have that in the slip form. So the connection points are at the bottom of the structure, which then will be flooded. So we had to remotely release the hooks and also use typical oil and gas equipment, which is ROV release hooks with uh, yeah, quite large ROV release hooks then of course for the thousand ton uh, capacity. And as you see, there is Quite, it's a bit difficult to see on the picture here, but we need to use the full capacity of the crane. So there's actually three different crane hooks working together to be able to accomplish the lift. And then there's of course the tugs here, and you can see that the substructure they are towing out uh, through the dock. And then when we got them out, we then towed them down to Domas Nest that I showed you, where we had already then installed the anchors and the three uh, barges. And here we can see the pictures from earlier this summer. This is one of the North Sea barges and the substructures are then sitting out on both sides of these uh, barges. And then as we slip form, we reach uh, the first milestone, which is 66 meter height of this one from here to underwater, of course. And that is where we install the uh, J-tubes that will later pull in the power cable underwater. And it is also the mooring point here that we will connect the mooring to. So what you see here is actually the top part of the mooring, the mooring bridle, which is a quite a, um, 
fragile piece of equipment. It's a spiral strand wire and they have restrictions and they're also quite stiff and difficult to handle. So hence the rather large vessel to get it in because we need to maintain the integrity of this uh, product and we can have no twists or anything into the lines as they are connected on. So this vessel will then move up to the, to the point here and connect this mooring line in so they hang underwater. And then of course you see the point here with the better 3D modeling as these structures are then connected on here and the slip forming continues, they just go into the water and we will not be able to reach that point again from over the water. But as we do the come to the assembly, for instance, and the installation offshore, then we will have to use these spirals both to move and to tow, and then I tow again offshore, and then before we move in the same lines offshore. So there's a lot of connection points and different phases that needs to be detail checked before we actually get there. So already two years before we go offshore, we needed the full detailed operation, offshore operations detailed to know how we could connect this one in. So it's quite a close uh, cooperation between the actual design of the mooring system, the substructure and the installation of the structure. So this is why Duff and Arco Solutions are working so closely on this project already from the, from the early phase. And for those who are not familiar with mooring systems, these are then the, the anchors that are fabricated at Verdal in the uh, middle of Norway. And they are typical suction anchors. They are uh, roughly uh, 110 tons. And uh, yeah, there's no persons on the picture, but I will come a person later. But it's, I think, 12 or 15 meters high. It's relatively large suction anchors. Uh, and then continuing on at Domasnes still, when the stuff that we have completed, this is seen from above, the three naughty barges. And then, yes, they are completed. We need to fill solid ballast. And again, this is then quite a large operation. It's a total of over 50,000 tons of solid ballast that go into the structures. So then we will use uh, typical ballasting vessels that come, and then they are refilled with a feeder vessel that you see here. And then this part that you see here is the actual feeder, so it will rotate over and drop uh, the solid ballast into the into the substructures to get the sufficient stab stability in the structure structures. They're actually very stable just with water, but we need the, the center of gravity to be very low to maintain, uh, to keep it still while the turbine is on top, which is sitting quite high in the air with, uh, with its loads. So that's why we need so much weight in the vessel. Other than solid ballast, there's absolutely nothing in the, inside the, the substructure. So it's basically just a 90 meter hole in the sea. Uh, and with this operation, there are also, of course, additional moorings that needs to be designed into the mooring system of these barges, which also add to the size of it. And then there are additional anchors out here, which also then, of course, conflict again with the fiber of the cable that was installed, which is running outside here. And then there is some environmental considerations when you dump this solid ballast in here. As we do it, we need to pump out water, which is what you can see here. This one is just doing its release of water after it's released, uh, received the solid ballast. And then this water needs to be clean. Of course, you cannot take contamination. It's not toxic. The, the norit, which is the material you use to, to ballast them, but it's yeah, uh, dust in the water. So there are environmental boys, you can't see them on the picture, but there's one here and one here that is monitoring the, the water quality as we discharge the water. And there was no problems with that as we, we did that operation. And for the scale of things, the little green things here you can see are uh, 150 or 250 ton uh, mobile cranes that you typically see on onshore work sites. Uh, and then we have reached status right now. A few days ago, we completed the first uh, substructures. It's these two that ironically look like they're a bit smaller, but that's because at the end they narrow in, of course. So uh, these two are a full 107.5 meter, completely slip formed onto the top. And the only remaining activity on these two is actually to, 
to put on the deck that you can see here, fabricated that stored. So that would be another marine operation done from a, from a crane vessel to put the deck on and to get the J-tubes and the cables will come up through here onto the top here. And then the, the wind turbine is assembled on top there. So at the current stage, we have two that are completed for slip forming, and we have nine other structures. It looks here as if they are at different heights, but that's just because we're doing the balloting operation at this time. So you see the J-tubes are all, all on us. These are all 66 meters high, and we'll start with what's called the conical slip forming. Now, so then as we reach uh, October, I think mid or late October, we will install the, uh, the outer deck. Then we will continue doing that two structures at a time, uh, two new ones and two new ones until we are done with all the 11 uh, substructures. Then when we reach March, the first two or the first three will be towed up to the, the site up north in Gul where we will do the uh, assembly. Uh, so then I'm moving into a bit to the future for 2022, this uh, spring, then we will go into a new base, which will be Vergland Bas at uh, Jul. At that site, we will then uh, become the principal contractor, meaning that we will coordinate the works and have the overall safety responsibility. So we will typically set up fencing and decide logistics where you put the uh, blades and turbines and nacelles and all the parts that come. And Mammut has rigged actually the world's largest, uh, I think, uh, ring crane, mobile ring crane. So it's being built now at Gule Base. It looks quite small on this picture, but it's the, the same crane you see here. So it's actually a crane that comes in, I think it's 250 containers to, to build that uh, crane. So we will receive the parts and then we will install three mooring locations. It's four on this uh, illustration, but it's just, it will be three locations because after we assemble the turbines onto the substructures, we will tow them over here and then Siemens will complete the commissioning and the testing of the structures and also some cranes and other structures that is mounted onto the platform here, sensors, etc. Before they are then ready to be towed out. And we are delivering and outfitting this uh, barge, which basically just gives you the sufficient water depth from the key. It's just what you normally would call a spacer barge. And it will also have an access tower. Can't be seen here on this illustration, but there will be an access tower on here. Uh, and then as the tower is landed onto the substructure, it will sink into the water. So we will have a mooring that is continuously tensioning and allowing for the structures to pass down as the, as the structure come on. So the substructure is roughly 20,000 tons and uh, the wind turbine is, has a roughly a weight of 1,200 tons. So it, it will move uh, almost 10 meters down as you ballast it down. And the height, height here from sea surface to the top here is approximately 30 meters. So at this illustration, it, it doesn't give the proper scale. The, the, the turbine is much higher than this. Uh, yes, and then we will coordinate the CPI contractors, which are then Mammut for the crane and Siemens for the turbines. And there are also some smaller turbine, uh, smaller subcontractors, which for instance, uh, cable uh, deliverer, uh, CY7 will come in and uh, have a look and do some small tests on the on the pull-ins, etc. But uh, mainly it's Siemens and Mammut. So the management of this yard will start November this year, then it will be the building of the crane we will oversee. And then we will continue until we have towed the last one out, roughly uh, August 2022, depending on weather, of course. And then as we go uh, offshore, uh, we will use the two main vessels, which is the Skandiskansen, that is the anchor handler, multipurpose anchor handler that Carl introduced earlier. She will install the, the suction anchors. And uh, we will use Gandhi Iceman, which will tow out the, the floaters, and she will be supported by two third party vessels, probably, but roughly 150 ton bullet hole capacity to control the, the tow out and hook up of the floating wind turbine. 
So, yeah, pre-installation of the mooring system towels and hookup of the installed uh, mooring system. And I just thought I would give some examples of the scale of things and maybe some details on the mooring system here. So uh, what we're doing or have been doing so far is much interfacing here to ensure that the installation can be safe and that we have, cons have connection elements and possibilities to secure the, the lines as they are installed. That is for the towed face and also then with the interfacing here with the anchor and how this all fits onto the vessel. On this picture here, you can see basically the back deck of a vessel, the bow of the vessel would be over here. So this is the, the back deck. And there you can see the 250-ton heave compensated crane. And then for every trip, we plan to put out four anchors on the deck. That's the way the plan is now. This can, of course, change. But we are hoping to get four anchors in every trip. And then we have winches here, which also bring the, the lines for these anchors as we, as we go out. And uh, the suction anchors are roughly 100 tons. And we have a picture here from this is from the Goliath project in Hammerfest on FPSO installation, but these anchors are very similar and this is the same vessel. So the anchors in scale with the vessel will be roughly this size and here there is I think 12 and there will be 19 anchors on the on the high wind tumbling project. Um, and then there is a spiral strand why it doesn't look too big is this wire you see here which connects to the bridle that you saw that were installed at the Domas Ness on the previous slides. And that's really the, the fragile part of it, which requires a lot of uh, care when we handle it. Um, and then the inline tensioner, there are three lines per windmill. I will show you that on the next slide, but there are two lines going from the windmill, which is just, what shall you say, dead lines. They are just connected in each line and there is no tensioning. And on the floater, there is no space for winches to pull in and tension the mooring system. These winches will be way too large, so the actual anchor handlers, hence the size of them, has to tension up. And then they will pull here on this inline tensioner on the third line to tension up the system and ensure that the windmill gets its sufficient characteristics so it sits still and the cable is not damaged and the windmill actually produces the power it, it shall produce. And here you can see there's a man standing on top of the anchor for, for scale for those that are not familiar with these types of uh, operations. And then uh, lastly, I just want to show you a bit about the actual field layout. Uh, you can see here on the 3D graphics that these are the 11 turbines and substructures floating and the water depth is then 300 meters roughly is from 280 down at this end of the field up to 300 uh, or down to 300 meter water depth here. So you can see the bridles that we saw on the picture for Domo's nest that are being installed and then it's the mooring system going down here. And these lanes are then the power cables. So this is then seen from above on a schematic. So SA is suction anchors, HY is the turbines, and these are the anchors here. So as the design is with shared anchors in the center here, you can see one anchor has three lines going out to the floaters. These anchors have one line and these anchors have two lines. So in total for the whole field, there's actually only 1.7 anchors per turbine, a total of 19 anchors, but 33 uh, mooring lines. So it's Quite a clever guy in Equinor who has thought out this, uh, this system here. So I think that uh, ends what I wanted to say from the Highland project. And then uh, if you have any questions, then I'm uh, open for that. Okay, thank you, Carl. Thank you, Frederick. That was an excellent presentation. I um, appreciate the two of you sharing your thoughts and really giving us a great insight into this project. So that's much appreciated. Just a couple of observations. We do have a couple of questions, but um, I, I suppose for me, the sheer magnitude and complexity of the project kind of surprised me. I think, you know, sometimes with these offshore turbines, the external su simplicity, if you like, belies the internal complexity of these giants. You know, we kind of see the very 
kind of three-dimensional simple shapes but you know so much goes into the, the development of these and I suppose the other key thing that did jump out at me was about the significant simops kind of coordination and collaboration that are all really key factors in the overall project success so that was uh, great I do appreciate that um, maybe uh, just a couple of questions so we'll just jump straight into these um, see if you can answer I think there's a couple I'll pitch to you first Frederick Yep. Um, how long does, does or did it take to construct each of the substructures? And then a kind of second question about once we're towing the, the complete assembly out, what's the maximum C state we can tow in? So maybe if you could answer those two questions, yep. Frederick. Yeah, so the construction started around Christmas, I think, for the first ones in the dock, and the first ones were completed now. So basically nine months then to build uh, build the two first but then of course we build all 11 partly in parallel so when we come to uh, I think June then all 11 will be will be finished so uh, roughly okay. uh, a year and a half to build all 11. Mm -hmm. But what's a bit interesting with that is that the philosophy is that as it's only 11 it's quite a large project but it's still not enough to make really a factory out of it. Yeah. So we build one at a time in a way, and then we let the structure sit still. But it was a lot of discussion if we should keep, you know, like a factory and move the floaters through the factory instead of moving people after the floaters. Yeah. But uh, for this project, it's it's one at a time. But uh, okay. Yeah. And what about that second part of the question about the towing um, sea states? Yeah, the the tow out is in principle unlimited. The way it is now you can tow it out in in any any weather basically okay but once you start hooking up and people have to work on deck then you need to come down to what's manageable for people to stay on deck and work safely and that's usually a significant wave height of around 2.5 to 3 meters depending the captain's decision but that's that's roughly where we are at okay and then uh, it's of course it's a production train this in a way so you need to have turbines ready and what really takes the most time is yeah. assembly of the actual turbine the big crane that is there that's what will hold the progress the way it looks now and then of course there is wind limitations when you put on the the blades on the nacelle so that's a very critical operation that might take some waiting i think that has like 10 or 15 meters per second uh, wind limitations there so yeah, and the actual okay. tow is not restricted, but there are some restrictions on weather, and we expect there to be some, some weather. Okay, way. thanks for that, Frederick. Just one quick question. Uh, we've only got time for one, one more question. I think I'll leave this at you, Carl. Um, just a comment here. Great project, great presentation. Congratulations to all involved. Um, could you perhaps tell us about DOF's perspective for Brazil's offshore wind market? That's a very specific question. Maybe with your global remit, you can talk a little bit to that Carl just in a one or two sentences yeah it's uh quite quite topical within DOF I wonder is it from from someone from DOF on the call <laughs> but, uh, yeah we're uh, we're constantly monitoring it um we we know there's opportunities with uh, from electrification as I mentioned down there but also some developments um with kind of near shore fixed wind uh fixed wind uh, uh production targets so yeah, I can't give an answer on too much, but we're, we're, we're looking at it. We've got a big team in Brazil and uh, we'll, be, we'll be there if it starts. Okay, thanks for that, Carl. Well, listen, I'm afraid, we, I'm sorry to say that's all we have time for today. Um, time runs away when you're sitting listening to a great presentation. So uh, I, I just want to share our sincerest thanks again to both Carl and Frederick for their time today, um, not just for the delivering of the great presentation, but for the work in preparing for that. So it's greatly appreciated. I um, think, as I mentioned at the start, our appreciation also extends again to our current branch partners, Billfinger UK Limited and Imrand. Again, without whose support, these events would also not be happening. So if there's any organisations out there on the call today that would like to consider a branch partnership with us, then by all means, please do reach out after this meeting and we can discuss, discuss a tailored offering to meet your needs um, and your budget. So that's uh, not a problem. Uh, just before I go, uh, I'd also like us to thank Katrina Dunbar, who's our local branch manager here in Aberdeen, really for all the work she does in the background in making these events happen so, happen so smoothly. 
So thank you, Katrina, as ever, a sterling job. Um, and perhaps finally, let me once more thank all of you for attending today's session. We certainly hope you found it informative and that you'll join us again for our next DI Live event. Um, remember, a copy of the recording and the slides will be sent out and made available on the branch website in a couple of days' time. But in the meantime, if you want to discuss membership, uh, presenting at future events, or really anything EI related, then please just email us. You can get us at Aberdeen at energyinst.org with the details and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. So please keep an eye out on the branch page for any upcoming events, but we will of course continue to notify you as normal in email, just ensuring your account preferences, you've checked that little box to receive details on the event updates. Um, and I think finally for me, I suppose, um, best of luck to the team at uh, DOF and DOF Subsea for the remainder of this fantastic project. Uh, I'm sure it will be a great success with um, uh, on all counts. So, so good luck with that. So we'll hopefully see you all again soon. Many thanks again for your continued support. The team here at Aberdeen Highland and Islands branch of the Energy Institute, we greatly appreciate it. So thank you very much for joining us and uh, goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.